I'm going to be reading three poems today. Um, maybe my skin is black. Glass that is so thin, I know if you touch me, I will shatter and crumble back into pieces of sand lost in the wind. Sometimes I feel weak with the knowledge that you could ruin me with a finger. The glass is made from heat hundreds of times hotter than an air that will melt flesh and cause terror that no one has ever dared to face alone. I mock those who dare to face me alone because they think they own me. I built myself from the fire of an anger that knows no master. People like me do not need statues in our names when we have broken ourselves for this power. People like me do not need dragons when from my lips I tear down cities with a single breath. I am not your Lotus Princess. Your public affirmation that you are not racist when all you need is a flap of yellow skin on your arm. I do not come in my bits and pieces. I am not a pair of tiny eyes or lips thinner than my wrists or silky midnight hair that's straight typhoons. I am not my numerical intelligence or my hidden accent or a collection of daddy issues that you believe exist. I am a person, a girl, a woman of color. I was not born to meet your status quo or help me fill your quota or conform to your idea of the perfect exotic. I am not a fruit waiting to ripen auditioning for a spot in your painfully white world. I am not, for I am stronger and bolder than you could ever imagine. I'll never be your fucking fantasy, for I kneel on my own terms. And I, have, and I do not need your confirmation or permission to shine brighter than you, for I am the North Star, the raging fire that is my own direction that will crush your idea of me. For my father taught me grace and honor, and my tiger mom taught me to swallow my enemies whole. Lie on and under beds and found love in the 3 a.m. static. My tears are warriors coming out for surrender and taking none of it, calling those who love me to duty and demanding to make me worthy again. My tears are a freely shared gift from a slap too hard, a lover's fight done right, a, fire, a fierce howl at another's trauma, a collective grieving in this cold steel world. My tears scare off those who could have never handled my fire anyway. They are limitless, will cast oceans on your sheets and your clothes, and the salt will stain your skin long after the blood comes out. My tears are a spell made of generosity, of intimacy, of the love of myself and my community. My tears are always at the ready, leaving black and scared trails and empty tissue boxes. My tears are my crazy. My tears are my fat. My tears are hard and mean and will fuck you up. My tears are love, are hope our longing and desperation. My tears are honest and heartbroken, are my lover and are writing you a letter. My tears are calling us home. My tears. Hi everyone, thanks for that introduction. I totally forgot I wrote that. So I was like, wow, Steph knows so much about me. <laughs> but um, it's great to be here. So the comic that I'm going to share with you today is called Gold Mountain. Um, this is a comic I wrote this past, last semester. Um, and Steph articulated it better than I can, so I'm just gonna go for it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read it as you can follow along on the screen, I think. That will probably work well, so I'm just going to get started. Awesome. Um, is this loud enough? Great. Okay. So. Gold Mountain. That's what they called it. It was the land of plenty, the land of streets paved with gold. At a time when life was harsh for many Chinese, North America beckoned, gleaming and bright. Many left their ancestral homes with little more than hope to line their bellies. Many settled in California. San Francisco is still known as Old Gold Mountain today. And others came here to British Columbia. In the Fraser Valley, 
Cary, Barkerville, everywhere it seemed, the gold sat waiting. But once it was scooped up, that was it. Gold wasn't exactly a renewable resource. Eventually the rivers ran out, and soon there was no more gold. No more money and no more opportunity. For many, working on the Canadian Pacific Railway became their only option. A job was a job was a job, even if it was for a dollar a day. They were often given the most dangerous sections to work on. Craggy mountain passes, rain-drenched underbrush. Then he died. Unlike gold, they were considered a renewable resource. Of the 9,000 railway workers, 6,500 were of Chinese descent. In 1882, John A. Macdonald said to his parliament, it is simply a question of alternative. Either you must have Chinese labor, or you cannot have this railway. After all, you could hire three chains for the price of one white man. Why bother doing otherwise? The railway is finally completed in 1885. That same year, the Chinese Immigration Act, 1885, is passed. Any Chinaman coming to Canada must pay a head tax of $50. The Chinese Immigration Act, 1900, hikes that up to $100, and the Chinese Immigration Act, 1903, moves it up even further, $500. Between 1885 and 1923, 97,123 Chinese paid an accumulated $23 million to the Canadian government. In a time when income and sales tax are still non-existent, this is a huge source of income for the government. In fact, many roads in BC were paved with this money. The Chinese have history here in BC. They were here before this land was taken and turned into Canada, and they are here now. They work, they play, they learn, and they live. Still, they are told, go back to where you came from. Still, we are told, you don't belong. Yesterday, today, not so different. There's an instinct to respond to this kind of hate with anger. We deserve to be here. The anger builds and builds until it leaves us unable to see anything but our own pain. Sometimes when that happens, we end up forgetting one very important truth. We are settlers, too. Those bloody tracks they had us build, each spike was slammed into occupied, stolen, ancestral, unceded Coast Salish land. How could we forget? Our suffering does not absolve us of our responsibility to each other, to the land. After all, for many of us, this is our only home. So gently, tenderly, we must do our best to deserve the lives we forged here on the summit of Gold Mountain. Thank you. Is this okay? Can you hear me? Am I too quiet? Is this good? Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so as Stephanie says, it's four poems into one, I guess, group called Meanwhile. Um, if there are reasons for titling it that, maybe just ask me after if you want, or you can just come up to my uh, <laughs> Everything turns on an end point. I wonder what is worse, the pain of knowing, not knowing, or the pain of unknowing that end. That end I imagined as I held a half seashell against the green rumination of the sea, thinking that it would remain broken, left on land, but a hole in the folds of my coat as I carried it towards you, waiting on the edge of the beach. Stranded in a timeless summer, still you move like the sea, briny overgrowths of a past life, whirling around your ankles. You remain a silver fish drowning at the bottom of my cup, belly swollen with salt and lightning in the many lifetimes that it takes. Mm -hmm. I understand the lift and gas between these ancient waves. The unfurling expanse of an empty blue sky pulls me apart, signifying the lack, the failure, describe how in every version of this dream I cannot remember if I ever reach you and deliver that proof of having walked the shore. For now we speak through our silence. I do not yet exist in your language and you do not yet exist in mine. Scattered I know that to translate longings to be, it begins with love, a thought, a question, a sting in the mouth. Where to begin if I cannot look into my own? How far must I wander before I spill out of this half dream? Lost in the hollow cave of my own voice, I unfold out of myself before collapsing into wholeness. Pinned beneath the brush stroke, I pause, lean into the words tracing a hole in the middle, a place for missing ghosts, a song born into a glass case. 
if this blue shell of a hydrosphere is yours and mine as well, if my thought for you is more than a small visitation of Rosette or a puncturing white wallpaper, if, as you will have it, my movement is more than a motion set against a slanted light in your reading room, only then will I feel you slipping through the walls of each heartbeat that you have imagined for me and say, so be it. Meanwhile, on the land across the darkening fields, I am 1,500 lifetimes from the weakened sunlight that glimpses through your windows to watch you rise. I am an irrepressible pulse of an existence finding its way home. You remain there in that solitude, a cusp, a liminal dream, a world in a dark pool. I turn my head and see nothing, only shadows, billowing in the still wind behind me, I die. Great stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm going to play a few uh, country tunes. And, uh, yeah, it's really funny uh, when I always mention that I play country music. The first question they ask is, but you're in Egypt. <laughs> yeah? So what other? I just figured you might be into hip-hop bands or like cooking or something like that. I like those too, yeah. <laughs> I like country music also, so, you know, what's wrong with that? Nothing, exactly. <laughs> so, um, this song is uh, covered by, uh, by John Harker. It's called In Tall Buildings, and it's, it's about working. And I know a lot of us work, you know. Sometimes we work for family, sometimes we work for ourselves, sometimes we work for a significant other. Uh, for me, I work for student loans. So, here's a song about student loans. <laughs> Going to work in town, 
that I listened to when I arrived to Canada was country, so it's legit. Um, so basically all the photos that you see, you'll see is Eric's, and um, it's basically just about what it's like living here, and I found a little um, book of poetry by M Michael Turner called Kingsway. It was written 10 years ago, and it's a little outdated, and this is slightly more contemporary. <laughs> conception of Kingsway. Okay. 
And it seems to the people who told me the next stop is in the blue light skirting across the craft day and only. She was in love with the fat fish, and so there's some of that thing still spinning. She may have fallen in the cycle of each trap, and so there was no language she understood better. She, that lucky one, knew how to suckle poison from cold store gas stations, how to spit seeds. She got to sleep between the walls of a collapsing critic left the mansion, one lock to the other. Listening for daydreams caught between eight and three being heart steps. It's only fair to love there, she'd say. Her family had moved from Joyce and Amado about a month ago. The grandfather calls that her children will grow up there, growing up to memorize the schedule of the nineteen bus. The time will retreats accordingly. Her own children, there were nineteen of them to teach their children how to hide between the wheels, those big, okay tires, how to stop traffic, how to dodge raccoon claws, and so always on the move in a world where we busy ourselves with comfort and up and down. She was the last one of them to figure that out, but the 19 bus was always late. Next this show sucks. Take me to church's chicken to the Trinidad Jean slap spot flying in its cannabis pit stop. I have no European blood, not even from spy analysis, and speak perfect English. So the bird flew soon is just outside the liquor store, and I'm all my hair and out of sheets. This matinee playing on stolen territories, my complicity a flowing cookie, concealing the ground beneath me, beneath you. Take me to the Black Lodge, where Jersey sits with a happy and salad. Soft hands sliding smoothly, one finger at a time. Around an untouched beer bottle, the last drink before the big drink. The first long drink of the year. A gray shower splashes across the faded awnings, reminding me, Do you speak English? What's your name? How old are you? What do you study? Take me to Best White's latest. To the top floor where the pits pocket the city up and down, reminding us of peach stone surprises stuck in our milk warm throats, hiding its nutrients inside until I remember that special kid the only one who could ride his bike with no hands when I moved to Kingsway. There were splinters in my shoes, all the way out of tree branches that didn't used to be there. We were up for a few short months. Then she took me there. Can you imagine a father crying by the country pen? I just could not believe his daughter would ever live there, could not ever believe. Right on the side of the street, this tiny, tiny house. That could make any sentence of stoke master and principal crumble. Wedged between moving hands and heads raised so high. Take me to make a chill pizza. You can go on a mountain come there ever again. Not with my Hi, my name is Tony. Could you spare two dollars? I just need to buy a pack of smokes. They found the eye in the auto box and fixed on the elder and gray on the sidewalk. The gaze of misrecognition between generations. We can't compare. Take me to Kilimanjaro Snack House, to the monstrosity of urban cafes and movie civic promises, wax and control them. All I know is everything must go. The store is closing. All of them have been often forgotten dancing on the night too. The one two shoved the right envelope into her hand so fast as to do get off the bus, but she kept arguing with you lucky eight money in passing from one wrinkled hand to another. Take me, take me, take me. Nina turned his money. You didn't see it coming. The way Kingsway soared across the open floor, like a blue bird scrambling to feed her family, looking the brown crumbs seeping outwards from silk slippers along the dank colonial road. Some say he was an eastward king. I say north because that's how you'll find Chinatown. 
an aging, swelling callus on your palm. Not that my connection is genuine. I was never here on Kingsway. I just had to be this Chinese settler's messy fashioning. A fool where I make King's Way real. If she could still hear me whisper, do not let my ancestry migration mother tongue betray me. I am not in the name of Chen's money. I embody hurtling, descending, ascending, gliding across an uneven pathway. Do not let them fool you. I am a visitor who was not asked to come. The matter of the oldest schoolhouse, the western train tracks, the master liquidators that have long closed the Christmas lights. Especially the Christmas lights. The next stop is Wilderlust. The next stop is Horikawara Fa. The next stop is liberal multiculturalism. The next stop is we are left on babies. The next stop is relax, you're right. The next stop is pipelines. The next stop is 1,500 Syrian refugees. The next stop is airports, landports, water ports. The next stop is remember those spaces of refuge. The next stop is, remember the spaces of refuse. The next stop is, let it hair and let it cheats. And when I dream, I dream of the lights on Kingsway. When you can hardly remember what you've survived, when everything is beautiful and your heart is so proud, when those who are missing stay silent, then yesterday's atrocities become triumphs. When yesterday's atrocities become triumphs, when you can hardly remember what you survived, when everything is beautiful and your heart is so proud, then those who are missing stay silent. When those who are missing stay silent, when yesterday's atrocities become triumphs, when you can hardly remember what you survived, then everything is beautiful and your heart is so proud. Thank you. Um, the next poem, I'm going to tell you a story. The poem has a story, and I'm going to tell you a story from my life, which has nothing to do with the poem, except that they have the same title. Um, <laughs> I was on the sky train and I was wearing um, my I'm a feminist button, which I wear often and I, uh, it's not uncommon for people to be more time and say, oh, I like your button, so that's nice. And one person said, oh, I like your button one day, and she also said, where did you get it? And I said, well, I got it at UBC, they had like an I'm a feminist day, and there were seven buttons. And she was like, oh, there's feminists at UBC? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, yes. And she said, you know, but what about those Josh Wade chants? I was like, yeah, we, we, we didn't like those. <laughs> we weren't happy. Um, and she talked to me more, and it turned out that she went to SFU, and she had thought about doing a grad degree at UBC in, I think, 
sociology, so he's like, I just went out to that little day that they have there, and it was so run, run down, it just shows what their priorities are. But SFU is a really great feminist space. So, <laughs> I don't know if that's true. Um, I haven't heard 100% great stories about SFU. I'm sure it's lovely in a lot of ways, but I thought that was just a really strange reaction to say that I got a feminist by the BBC. So, I wrote a poem called Her Institution is Now a Feminist. <laughs> For a while I worked making cold calls, collecting cash for a good cause, playing my words like a live action answering machine. I'd call a woman from the middle of the list, follow the script. I'd say, think of goodness like a paper house. We know the shape, but it needs support to stand in the real world. From my window, watch a stream of nobodies pressing through the day. That day I said, would you consider? No, she wasn't really interested. A young woman walked the path outside the window. I saw her face. It was my job to keep her on the line. It's people like you and I, she was crying. I'm sorry, I meant to say we are a strong organization. This is how things happen in the real world. Your donation is what matters. We will rest easy with proper foundations. The girl fell down. There are too many people I can no longer see her. I'm paid by the hour, must stay on the line. The truth is that no revolution ever had a script, and I am not equipped for honesty. Is she hurt? The woman loses patience. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your valuable time. Could be me or her who has to mind. Where is she? I hang out my plastic smile. Voices bounce off cubicle walls, taller than my line of sight. This next poem is called Call and Response. And I'm just going to say the last two poems. I wrote the second one as a set of footnotes to the first one, and I don't know how that's going to work out with me reading it, or even at all. So that's just something to keep in mind when I'm reading it. So this first one is called Call and Response. Every morning the tide came in, glittering driftwood, soaked cigarette butts, lost scales and cracked shells. As the sun rose, she let it lap her toes, washed them clean of the night's ruminations. She couldn't see the other shore, or think of the crews hauling necks against the current, even today. The salt seemed no different than her own occasional sweat and tears. West of the westernmost point, a little boy who could have been her grandfather peered out with a toy telescope rolled from a bittersweet household package. Watched as she retreated hopelessly in land, sent an echoing greeting that rang on the ocean floor. So many thousands of them. What brought the tide back in? She saw it coming, maintained their trek on the distance. It leaned back again, fleeing the sole set of footprints in the sand. This last one is called Bio Beyond Biography. One. The poet is descended from fishermen on one side, boat builders on the other. The poet descends from her third person perspective. Two. The Point Grey Peninsula on the western edge of Vancouver. I lived here for four and a half years, almost inside of the ocean. Three. My grandfather was born in Japan. The story goes that as a boy, he was fond of painting. This long ago boy's mind, my father's father, makes anecdote and memory create a soft portrait. Four. A family story, a grain of sand on an important beach. It's written about in books. You can learn all these things, say their names, each one. Fuck. It is not so personal. Facts, language. Knowing the pull of history, it does require an eye. It does require some kind of family. It is not so unique. It does give a poet a reason to speak. Thank you.